Iván. Dime. No se ve el año de los trabajos que citas. Ah, perdón. Es verdad, no, no, no está el año. Hmm. Pero supongo que copiando y pegando ya sale bien. O lo dices en palabras. Sí, vale, 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 perdón. Está bien. Bueno, creo que podemos comenzar. Eh, good morning, everybody. Eh, we will continue today with our series of internal ICC UV uh, seminars. And today we have uh, Ivan Morera from the group of Quantum Technologies. And he will tell us about the uh, ultra cold uh, one dimensional quantum liquids and droplets. Uh, and I remind you that the talk is uh, 13 minutes and we will have a break uh, in the middle. Please, uh, Ivan, uh, you can start. Okay, thank you, Jorge. So first of all, let me to thank the organizers for inviting me and to organize these seminars in difficult times. So as Jorge said, today we'll be talking about quantum liquids in ultracool atoms. And part of this presentation will be based on these two words that were done last year and this year. And this was in collaboration with Grigor Strakarczyk from the UPC. And yeah, these two words have a special meaning for me since we're the last two words that I did with Artur. And I'm sure that most of you knew him, but for those who don't, he was my supervisor of my, th of my thesis. And unfortunately, he passed away last August. And I just wanted to say that he was an excellent advisor, of course, but on top of that, he was an excellent good person. And I think that that is what is important. And why he will be always remembered. But then we have to move on. And as I said, I will be talking about quantum liquids. And the first thing that I want to do is to introduce a little bit of a context of ultracool atoms. So because I assume that most of you are not experts on ultracool atoms. And after that, we can do like a coffee break. I think that the organizers want to do that. And after that, I will present some of the results that we obtained for these quantum liquids in lattices. So. Let's start talking about ultracool atoms. As the name says, these are atomic systems, namely are alkaline atoms like rubidium, potassium, and so on, and they are at ultra cold temperatures. And the temperatures that can be reached actually in experiments are of the order of few nano Kelvin. So we are very close to the absolute zero of temperature. And the other thing which is very important is that these systems are ultra dilute. So if you compare the densities in these systems, they are 10 orders of magnitude more dilute than any other fluid in Earth. So for example, water or other kind of, of quantum fluids like liquid helium, the compare densities is 10 orders of magnitude almost. That makes that these systems are under some such extreme conditions that you can reach new phenomena, new quantum phenomena like, like Bose-Einstein condensation. And yeah, this is a sense to the technique which is called laser cooling and trapping. And here I'm sh sh just showing a picture of the people who mostly contribute to the development of these techniques. These are five Nobel Prizes that we had in the ICAP conference a couple of years ago in Barcelona. And yeah, after the discovery of this or the experimental observation of Bose-Einstein condensation, the field quite exploded. And here I'm just showing to you how does it look an experiment of ultracool atoms. This is a picture taken from the Leticia Starwell group experiment. And this is in ICFO in Barcelona. And as you can see, these experiments let's say that you can reach such extreme conditions on top of a table. And I think that what is what, why is so wonderful this field. And if you see that, it looks like an optics experiment, but all the physics happens in this object. This is the vacuum chamber, and this is where the atoms are loaded. So everything happens inside this object. And as I said, after the discovery of the Bose-Einstein condensation, the field exploded and people started to do crazy things. And One of the other things that the people was able to do is to introduce what we call an optical lattice. And basically this is to introduce an external periodic potential that traps the atoms. And in that way, you're creating something that resembles the crystalline structure of a solid. And the Hamiltonian that describes these, let's say bosons on this periodic potential is what we call the bose Howard Hamiltonian. And basically it consists of two terms. This is very simple. You have a term that is taking into account the kinetic energy of the bosons 
this term is moving a boson from one side to the other between two adjacent sides, and then you have an interaction between the bosons. And because the system is so dilute, you can neglect all the details of interaction, the van der Waals interactions between atoms, and just consider contact-like interactions, so really local interactions. And this is how you write these kind of terms. This is just taking a couple of bosons, and every time you have a couple of bosons, you have an interaction strength, which is U. This is very simple. But what is interesting is that this kind of Hamiltonians were initially introduced in the context of condensed matter physics. And basically, people introduced these Hubbard Hamiltonians to describe the movement of electrons in a solid. So you have electrons, and you have some underlying crystal structure. But what is interesting now is that de la trobada perquè us anirem combinant al, algunes um, gravacions de dels infants que sorry. que per vosaltres perquè us pugueu fer una idea i aterrar els conceptes que I think that there is someone which is not mute. Okay, now it's fine. <laughs> okay, and as I was saying, um yeah, this kind of Hamiltonians were introduced in condensed matter physics, but now in ultracold atoms they can create these Hamiltonians. So we can use ultracold atoms to simulate solids and what is what we call a quantum simulator and initially people did that to, to simulate condensed matter physics like simulating superconductivity quantum medicine material, materials and other things in an experimental way and it it's very controlled the system but then people start to elaborate more complicated hamiltonians and people now is trying to simulate quantum chemistry or even lattice gate theories in ultra cold atoms and this is a kind of experience I want to show you to show the power of ultra cold atoms. That is what we call a quantum gas microscope. And this is the first time that experimentally we have single side and single atom resolution. So basically now experimentalists can look at each side of the lattice and tell to you if there is an atom or not. So you have a lot of, let's say, precision over the system, but at the same time, you have a lot of control. So what they can do is with external magnetic fields, change the geometry of the system. And for example, I'm showing here you a picture in which they put all the atoms in a one-dimensional chain. So they can create one-dimensional systems or 2D or 3D or very different kind of geometries, but they can even play with the atoms and create very funny patterns like creating a, a C made of uh, lines of atoms. So this is just to illustrate to you that in ultracold atoms, in experiments, they have a lot of control and they have also a lot of precision. And that is why it's so rich in experiments. And now the next thing that I want to show you is how you can create quantum liquids. Because for most of the time, people thought that ultra cold atoms are quantum gases. That is because the system is so dilute. Remember, 10 orders of magnitude more dilute than water. That interactions cannot play the role that you have in liquids, and you cannot create liquids, therefore. So now I want to show you how you, can you create a quantum liquid in ultra cold atoms. And in order to do that, I want to exemplify it with a particular example, which is the Bose-Bose system. So consider a, a Bose system of atoms in which you have two different types. Let's call them A and B. So again, because you are in a very dilute regime, you can neglect the shape of the potential and consider just contact-like interactions, which are parameterized by DCs. So you have an interaction between atoms of the same species, namely GAA and GBB. And just by simplicity, let me, let's consider that these are equal, and I will call them G. And this is positive. G is positive, meaning that you have a repulsion between atoms of the same species. And then you have interactions between bosons of different species, GAB, and this is attractive. So bosons of different species attract to each other, and of the same species repel to each other. And this kind of systems, which you can introduce theoretically, they can be produced in experiments, and people have been using, for example, two different atoms in the same experiment, like potassium. Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah, tell me. I understand that the system is dilute and you can ignore uh, uh, interactions unless the atoms are very close to each other. But uh, why is a delta function? Realistic atoms uh, don't have uh, this uh, a delta function force. I in you can, for example, Let's, let's say theoretically simulate with, a, for example, a square wave potential, right? Or something like that. But what you can see is that in the end, the, all the physics can be explained by a single parameter. That would be like the scattering length, the S wave scattering length. So the important point is that you can parameterize the interaction with a single parameter. And in that case, I'm saying G, 
So what it's is? a kind of phenomenological interaction that takes into account uh, some dynamics that you want to describe, perhaps. Yes, yes, yes. But in the end, the, the good thing is that it works, that you don't have mm -hmm. to study all the details of the interaction. Okay. Thanks. And basically, it's because you are in the dilute regime. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay. So as I was saying, this kind of Bose Bose system, now we can study in a theoretical level. And the first thing that you can do is a classical approximation. And that's what we call in the many body field, um, the mean field approximation. And under such approximation, you can obtain the energy of the system as a function of density. And you see that it goes density squared times some constant, which is delta G. And basically delta G measures the difference between the repulsion and the attraction in the system. And this is very simple. If you have more repulsion than attraction, you see that the, the, the energy grows with increasing density. But if you have more attraction than repulsion, you see that the energy becomes more and more negative with increasing density. And that is basically telling to you that the system wants to have infinite density. So the system is mechanical and stable, and it will collapse. And this, this is what it comes from the classical approximation. And the clever idea by Dima Petrov was to introduce the something more, which is called the quantum fluctuations. And these quantum fluctuations, for many body people, this is to consider the Bogoliot de Jeans approximation. So basically, you have a very nonlinear system, which is because you have interactions. So you, you linearize the system, you compute the excitations, you obtain that you have phonons. These are gapless excitations. And then you obtain the zero point motion of these phonons. And you have this energy, extra energy contribution coming from these phonons. Um, for people that is more familiar with field theory, this will be like performing a Gaussian approximation to your partition function, or with like a one loop calculation. But in any way, what you see is that you have an extra contribution to the energy. And this extra contribution is positive defined. Because remember that G is positive in this situation. And what is interesting is that you see that the classical approximation goes with delta G, but the quantum part goes with, goes with G. So you can tune independently both and make, let's say, the contribution, the classical contribution of equal strength than the quantum contribution. So now in the situation in which you would predict collapse at the classical level, you have a negative term over here. This negative term can be compensated by this plus term over here. And it's very funny. Dima Petrov called this a quantum mechanical stabilization of a collapsing system. So you are stabilizing a, a classical unstable system by quantum fluctuations. But now we have to ask ourselves, what is the state of matter under such situation? Because we know that we don't have collab, collapse, but what do we have? And what we have is a quantum liquid. So let me define to you how we define um, a quantum liquid at zero temperature. So basically, this comes from computing the equation of a state. So you compute the energy per particle as a function of density. And you can do that at zero temperature. And you see that you have two possibilities. One possibility is that you, you see that the energy always increases with density. And it goes to zero when density is zero. And this is a situation for a gas. And this is a, the typical thing that you say for a gas. A, wants, a gas wants to reduce its density to decrease the energy. So if you put a gas in an infinite volume, it will expand always and all, forever. But a liquid, what happens is that you see that you have a minimum of energy at finite value density. So if you put a liquid in an infinite volume, it wants to stay at this density. And that's what we call the equilibrium density of a liquid. And it's given by the interactions of the system. It's uni uniquely determined by interactions, not by the external confinement. So now what happens if you put, let's say, a liquid in a finite box, a very large box, what you see is that you have coexistence between these two phases. You have coexistence between this minima and this minima over here. So you see that you have a flat plateau of density in the bulk. And then you, and this density coincides with the equilibrium density of the liquid. And then outside of this region, you have vacuum. And the vacuum is just the gas at zero temperature. And that's what we call a droplet. And it's like a classical droplet, like water, for example. So you have here some surface tension. And then you have a flat bulk. But I want to warn you that sometimes you can obtain different kinds of solutions in this kind of problems with liquids 
which are completely inhomogeneous, like this orange one. And I am not going to discuss a little more about these solutions, but in our field, we call this a soliton because this has some solitary web properties. But what I want to do is to really focus on, on these droplets, on these quantum droplets. And yeah, after you have, let's say, this theoretical prediction in ultra cold atoms, then experimentalists try to reproduce that. And the first ones was the Leticia Starwell group here in ICFU in Barcelona, in which they produce a Bose Bose mixture and they obtain the following. So here you have the situation when you have delta G positive. So this will be the gas. This is a situation in which you have delta G negative. This will be the liquid. And this experiment consists of having a, an initial trap. So initially you have all the atoms confined in some region and at zero time they open the trap and they study the free evolution of the system. And as I said, for a gas, what you see is that the gas starts to expand and expand forever. But if you, if you are in a liquid phase, what you see is that the system produces a droplet and it stays there for very long times. So they were able to observe the droplet formation. So basically, experimentally, they were able to verify this theoretical prediction of the formation of quantum droplets. That's, that was a couple of years ago. And I just wanted to say that this is not particular of the Bose Bose system. So you can produce the same things with other systems. And for example, consider a single species of bosons, but with long range interactions, that like they can also produce that. And basically they use a dipolar interaction between bosons that you have a decay that goes like one over distance to the power three. And in that system, they can also create these quantum droplets. And the kind of theory that explains the formation of these quantum droplets in dipolar systems is the same one. These are droplets which are formed thanks to the role of quantum fluctuations. And yeah, basically, I just wanted to say here that these droplets or liquids are very classical in the sense that they are self-bound systems, they have a flat density in the bulk, and then they have a surface tension. This is like typical droplet properties like water, but at the same time, they are, they are very exotic because we are working in a ultra dilute regime. So remember, these droplets have 10 orders of magnitude more, less density than water or liquid helium, the other quantum liquid that we have in nature. And at the same time, the origin of these droplets is really quantum. It comes from these quantum fluctuations. And I think it's particularly interesting because we have a strong quantum fluctuations, even though the system remains weakly interacting. So I think that this is particularly challenging our intuition about quantum many body systems, in which you typically expect that for small interactions, you can neglect quantum fluctuations. But this is, this is no longer true in these systems. And yeah, this is basically what people have been doing with quantum droplets. But now I want to tell you what we want to do. So basically, I have explained to you these quantum liquids, quantum droplets, and also these optical lattices, this kind of lattice structure that can be created in ultra cold atoms. And our idea was to mix everything together and put quantum liquids in a lattice structure. And of course, the motivation is that in these optical lattices, they have a lot of control and they can engineer different Hamiltonians. So you can start to play with interactions in these systems. And that can be funny for liquids, for example. And the other thing that they can do is to change the dimensionality. And we will be focusing in 1D situation, really 1D systems. And of course, when, once you start to study these kind of quantum liquids in lattices, it comes some important questions like, what is the role of the lattice structure in liquids? Because you are mixing like lattice and liquids. So these are very, two very different properties and you're mixing everything together. So it can be really interesting. Of course, you can start to ask to yourself, how can you define a continuum limit of a lattice liquid? We are starting to explore this kind of physics and we are discovering that it's not very simple. And then we are also studying what are the universal aspects of liquids. And if I have time later, I want to show you a little bit about this universal theory of liquids. Okay, so that was a little bit of context. And maybe if you want, we can stop here and do the coffee break. I don't know if you want to do yeah, that. Yeah, I think, uh, think it's a good uh, point to stop. Mm -hmm. uh, let's uh, make a break for 10 minutes uh, for questions. Um, uh, is there any question? Well, I have several questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, the calculation by Petrov is uh, 
on the quantum fluctuations is in the context of some field theoretical model? Um, he didn't do that. It was not based on field theory. It's more in many body context. But I think that you can do the same in field theory. So define like a field theory, a non-relativistic field theory for two Bose fields and do Gaussian approximation. So compute the partition function under Gaussian approximation. Do people uh, use uh, field theory models to say a scalar field to model these uh, quantum droplets or, or not? I think that this has not been done, but I think that this is doable, yes. So people, not for these quantum droplets, but for ultra cold atoms, like quantum gases, people have been able to do that. And another yeah. question I have is uh, this coefficient five over two, uh, shouldn't depend on the dimensions? Exactly, this is for the 3D case, yes. Ah, okay. This is true. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it's not very complicated to obtain the exponent because it comes like a from a loop integral in the end. So it is related to the momentum. So it goes with the dimension in the end. Yeah. I don't remember exactly how was it. Maybe it's 2D plus 1 over 2, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or 2D minus 1 over 2. Yeah. So, so uh, Ivan? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, no, another question. Uh, you know, very exciting topic. Uh, I'm learning a lot, I think, but uh, I, I wanted to ask a technical issue, which is, um, well, two questions, basically. So when you, when you say that you can build this uh, optical lattice, right, mm -hmm. how is this lattice actually made so that you have a potential where, you know, your, your uh, atoms will be sitting? Uh, and, and the other question is, um, you know, you say that you can reach temperatures as low as one nano Kelvin. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you make a vacuum inside some uh, container or some this tube, right? Mm -hmm. uh, with these very low densities also. But then uh, what is the temperature at which the walls of this cavity uh, is? And how do you avoid the radiation from this wall to heat these atoms too much? So concerning the first question, the optical lattice is made with lasers. So basically, they interfere too late well, many lasers, and they create a standing wave. And with that, and the atoms are sensible to that, to this standing wave. So that is from the experimental point of view. And about the second question, so the atoms, um, let's say that they are trapped with an external magnetic field. So the, the walls are very far away from the atoms. I would say that. So initially, people started to do ultra cold atoms, and they there was a physical container, and I think that that was the main issue, that they could couldn't lower the temperature so much. So now you don't have like a physical container, but you have external magnetic fields, yeah. and you're avoiding heating from, let's say, the walls and so on, the physical walls. Actually, just just a you comment on, on that. Precisely, I mean, what Ivan was saying. So there were, let's say, the the quest for Bose-Einstein condensation was for many years, like 20 years, there was a group at MIT trying to Bose condense in containers using the same techniques they would use to cool liquids up to, let's say, helium, uh, liquid, liquid helium. I mean, so you use the Joule effect, basically, and you, you keep cooling things. But then what they got is that actually they're, they're, these were molecules, I think, of hydrogen. They were getting a stick to the walls so they couldn't get to Bose condensation because at some point they the yes the walls were playing a very important role yeah. so the field completely changed and it was optics that entered and there with this were these optical means to cool and trap atoms where you actually don't have any container so the the chamber is much larger than the size of the cloud and the cloud is standing there because you put lasers that are tuned to some internal transition of the atoms, such that the atoms, you can, I mean, they basically feel essentially a potential. I mean, so mm -hmm. they are just standing in, in a super good vacuum. And this is why these systems are, are very, very promising because they are very clean. Okay. Very, very clean. But you still have, I mean, uh, the presence of the black body radiation. So you say that there is no cooling on these walls, which no matter how far away they are, you know, if they are at room temperature, say uh, 200, nearly 300 Kelvin, there is black body at 300 Kelvin. 
So somehow these atoms in the optical lattice don't get heated by this. Uh, these numbers I would need to see. I mean, no, in principle, not. No. no. At least I haven't heard any experiment where they worry about that. I see. But somehow is when they are in this optical lattice, they are not interacting with uh, whatever black body is around them. I guess you can neglect it. I mean, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, I I don't see. I should see exactly what are these numbers. Okay. Yes. And basically, what they have is a chamber, which is uh, let's say 15 centimeters, and the cloud is a micrometer. So and it's in the middle, and it's the standing there yes. because you yeah. keep it held by these lasers. These lasers. So, okay. Uh -huh. So the interaction of the laser with the atoms is through some resonance line of the atoms. That is yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there are some atoms that we know how to cool and others that we don't, I mean, or, or, to, or to trap. I mean, so they, yes. not every atom is trappable. So there is rubidium, cesium, there is also now strontium, right. these prosium, so there is a, a sewer of atoms that have been cooled. And in the beginning, the field was basically trying to, to build condensates. And now it's much more, I mean, now with these optical lattices, it's, it's really basically building many body systems uh, under very good control. So. Mm -hmm. OK, so, so some, I mean, somehow the, the laser that you're using to create this uh, optical lattice is acting as your uh, refrigerator here. So you're constantly doing work to keep those atoms cool, right? Exactly. In, uh, Yes, yes, yes. So there is there is a bunch of techniques, but one of them is Doppler cooling. So the, yes, yes. So there are always uh, laser shining on this system. Actually, for instance, in the experiments of Taruel, can you put the slide? Yeah. In the experiments of Leticia, so uh, this is actually the table. This is the chamber. If you go one more, I mean, where they put the droplets. So basically, they they have their you see for instance in this sequence that uh, ivan is showing on the left basically initially the lasers are on so the the atoms are trapped here there is no optical lattice it's just a trap yeah uh, let's say like a harmonic oscillator trap can be well represented like that and at some point they just switch off these lasers and what they see is that the system in the middle row is self-sustained so there is something produced there that does not disperse now there is no trapping and instead of dispersing, as you would expect from a gas or, or just a single particle, you see something that still remains bound. No? And this is really, they just click the switch, the bottom off, and they, re they remove the lasers. <clears throat> That's all, sorry. More questions, comments? Yes, just one, one more question. If you look into these trap states, uh, sorry, these droplet states, and you look at individual atoms, are they all always at zero momentum or they have a finite momentum? So I think that this experiment has not been, let's say, they have not looked at that, but from the theoretical point of view, in this perturbative calculation, you're assuming that they are condensed. So you have a boson instant condensation. So most of the atoms will be in the zero momentum state inside the droplet. Yeah. Thanks. But I, I have to say that that is from the theory part, right? So you're assuming boson instant condensation always. Later, I will show you in our in our works that we are not assuming, for example, boson instant condensation. And what we assume is that these droplets are super fluid inside. So this is a, a space modulated condensate, right? If I want to put words on it. Yeah, maybe you can think in that way. Yes. Yeah, but but Ivan, I mean, this is a condensate, but I'm not sure about what you are saying about the zero momentum. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's I, not a zero I, momentum I, I, because let's, let's let's say things. Yeah. I mean, let's not because, aventurate. <laughs> yeah, because it breaks translational invariance, of course. So maybe you cannot use the basis of momentum to define it. Well, but si simply you have a, a condensate which is interacting. So it's a, a, a interacting bunch of atoms. It's not condensing in zero momentum. 
Well, I mean, but it can be a boss instant condens if it's still interacting, right? Yes, but not if the question is if the atoms are all at zero momentum. No, it's not not all the atoms are zero momentum. No, no, that for sure not. You have depletion, of, of course, but you can have a boss instant condensate with depletion. I will say that, and not the droplet, but for example, the liquid. If you study the liquid, then you are assuming that it's at zero momentum. The boss instant condensate. So for, let's say that for, if you have a very large droplet with a very flat bulk, if you look at one atom in this bulk, I will say that this atom, let's say that it's, you can really define a boss einstein condensate that zero momentum in, this, in the bulk of the droplet. What happens close to the surface, this, I don't know, for example, what can you say about the surface of the droplet? Okay, I think uh, we can continue with the talk. Okay, so the next thing that I want to discuss is what we have been doing in our works and basically is put liquids in these optical lattices. And what I want to show you is first, how can you define these quantum liquids in a discrete space? And then if I have time, I want to discuss some aspects of the universality of quantum liquids and droplets. So the first, the first thing that we did is to, okay, study the Bose, Bose Havard Hamiltonian. So basically this is a Bose Havard Hamiltonian. So bosons in an optical lattice in which you have two different types of bosons. And you have, let's say the hopping part. So the kinetic energy for bosons and you have for bosons A and for bosons B. Then you have interactions. You have interactions between bosons of the same species with a strength, which is U. And then you have interactions between bosons of different species with a strength which is UAB. And U is going to be positive and UAB is going to be negative. So you have repulsion and then attraction, like in the continuum initial proposal. And we are, we are going to study one-dimensional optical lattices. So we move to the 1D system and in a discrete space. And this is particularly interesting because we have tensor network techniques that allows us to obtain exactly the ground state at zero temperature. So no approximations, this is a numerical computation, which it's assumed to be exact. So there are strong theorems that ensure to you that the tensor networks can represent ground states of many body Hamiltonians at zero temperature, of course. And for example, here I'm showing to you the density profiles that we obtain, for example. You have density as a function of the lattice index. And basically you see these quantum droplets, you see that you have a flat bulk over here and outside of this, you have vacuum. So over here, you have some surface tension. You have coexistence between this liquid and, let's say, the vacuum. And this is for a particular value of the strength. For example, URT is 5. It's not so strongly interacting, but then you move to very strong interactions. And what you see is that the droplet survives, and it stays more or less the same. And now we are getting something very interesting, because first, this is not predicted by the original petrol theory. This, uh, this perturbative calculation doesn't work over here. We are in the strongly interacting regime. So we have to understand what is happening in these quantum droplets, in this 1D system. And because we have the quantum many way wave function, we can look at many other properties, not just the density, but really quantum things, let's say. And the next thing that I want to show you is what is the quantum structure of these quantum droplets. And um, basically what we know is that in 1D, there is no long range order. So it's not possible to have a boson instant condensate. That is the thing that I was saying before. But still, you can, you can have quasi long range order. And typically, this is a signature of the appearance of superfluidity. And in order to detect the appearance of superfluidity, what you look at that is to the correlation function of creating a boson outside J and destroying outside Y. And if this correlation function decays with a power law, so one over distance with some power, this is telling to you that you have superfluidity. And this is typical definition in 1D, but for the mixture, now you can have different things because you can define different correlation functions. You can define the correlation function for bosons from the same species with A and separately with B, and this can have a power law decay, but you can also define this correlation function in which you are creating a pair on side J, a pair of a boson A and a boson B, and you destroy it on side I. And this can also decay with a power law. So you have the following criteria to identify the phases. If both correlation functions decay with a power law, you have a two superfluid. 
And basically, these two superfluids is telling to you that each species is a superfluid by itself. And one is independent from the other one, mostly. But you can have an another thing, which is you look at the single correlation function, and in the case, exponentially fast. So this tells to you that each species is not a superfluid. But then you look at the pair correlation function with this four body operator, and in the case with a power law. So in this example, what happens is that each species is not a superfluid, but the pairs become superfluid. And that's what we call a pair superfluid phase. So basically, in the mixture, you can have these two different phases. And here I'm showing to you the two droplets that I showed you before. And what you see is that the first one, at very weak interactions, it's a two superfluid. So you have two superfluids inside the droplet. But at very strong interactions, what you see is that each species is not a superfluid, but the pairs are superfluid. So basically, inside the droplet, you will see that each atom is paired with another one, A and B. And then these pairs become superfluid. And of course, this phase cannot be predicted by perturbative calculations because you have pairing. This kind of pairing is very similar to what happens, for example, with, with electrons when they create superconductors. When electrons create um, <clears throat> Cooper pairs, and then these pairs become superconductors. So here you have pairing of bosons, and then these pairs become superfluid. And the next thing that we wanted to do is try to explain the appearance of these quantum droplets, which have this pair superfluid phase inside the bulb. And in order to do that, now it comes the role of the lattice. So in a lattice geometry, you can always define an effective Hamiltonian describing new degrees of freedom in a consistent way. So what we do is to write down an, a Hamiltonian, which only contains the pair's degrees of freedom. And this can be done, as I said, consistent in the lattice. And basically, you're integrating out some high energy degrees of freedom, and you remain in this low energy superspace. And now, once we have this Hamiltonian, we study the scattering problem of two pairs in a lattice. And you have to think that from the original model, this is solving a four body problem. You have four atoms in a lattice, which is not doable, of course, analytically. So we write down this effective Hamiltonian between pairs, and then we study the collision of two pairs. That is a two-body problem that we know we know how to solve it exactly. And once we solve this scattering problem, we define an effective pair-pair interaction, which is like a four-body force. And what we see is something beautiful that this pair-pair interaction as a function of the original interactions, U, it is attractive in some regime and in other regime is repulsive. So even though you always have this repulsion U, you see that pairs in some regime attract to each other and in other regime repel to each other. When they attract, they create a four body bound state. And that's in what we, what we call a tetramer. So it's a really four body bound state, and it looks like. So you have two pairs which are very close in a space, in real space in the lattice. Basically, they are in adjacent sites, and they move together, these, four, these two pairs. But in the other which, regime, which you have repulsion between pairs, basically what you see is that the two pairs repel to each other, and they are separated in real space. And you have these two different possibilities. So now, this is, let's say, analytically. And now we move to many body pairs. And in order to do that, we use tensor networks again. And we start to put more and more particles and to obtain the ground state of the system numerically. And what we see is something beautiful, and is that when the pairs attract to each other, in the many body problem, you observe a liquid of pairs. But when the pairs repel to each other, basically, in the many body problem, you see a gas. And I think that is something interesting that we can understand the many body phases just studying this pair-pair interaction. So it's a few body from to many body transition that is doable, exactly. And here in what I want to illustrate to you how this pair dropping looks like. So basically, here I'm showing the how does it look the pair-pair interaction in real space. So what you see is that when two pairs are in the same site in the lattice, they feel a very strong repulsion, very, very strong. So you cannot put two pairs together in the same site. And basically, you can effectively study that as a Pauli principle. So you can study, you can understand that the pairs are fermionizing. So you have a Pauli, a Pauli principle that is not allowing to you to put two pairs on the same site. But then you have a residual attraction between nearest, second, second neighbor, and so on, that is attracting the pairs. So basically, what you see is when you start to put more pairs in the lattice, you, you see that they form a chain of pairs. 
So if you put four pairs, they form, they occupy the four sides together and they create this many body bound state. And it's particularly interesting because I like to say, to think about this, this kind of droplets as a compact object, which is sustained by poly principle. So basically you cannot have collapse of all the pairs together because you have this effective poly principle and then you have some residual attraction between pairs between near sites that is sustaining the quantum droplet. And this is sense to the lattice, to this discrete geometry. So it's like a lattice sustained quantum droplet. And of course, at some point, it would be interesting to put more and more strong interaction. At some point, maybe we can break the poly principle and maybe we can have collapse of the pairs or maybe we can have other phases, for example. This is something that we don't know, for example, yeah. And yeah, this is um, what I wanted to say about these lattice liquids. I don't know if there are questions at some point. Um, if not, I will move to the to this thing, the universality of quantum liquids and droplets. So this is an ongoing work with Manuel Valiente, which is a quite expert on quantum fluids. Basically, we want to address the following question. So what is the universality of liquids? And very general question. So we know that for gases, when you are in a very dilute regime, you have very low densities, then the shape of the interaction between gases doesn't really matter. So you can obtain with two very different Hamiltonians the same equation of state for two gases, basically. But what happens with liquids, and I think as far as I know, nobody explored that for a liquid. So basically what we are doing is the following. So we are matching, we have two different Hamiltonians. The two Hamiltonians give a quantum droplet as a ground state. And we match all the energies for all number of particles. So basically, if you have a quantum droplet, you can expand the energy per particle in the following expansion. This is like the, the drop model that you found in nuclear physics. You have a contribution, which is the bulk part. Then you have surface. Then you have curvature, and so on. And basically, you have two Hamiltonians with two different energy per particle, and you match them. So basically, you are matching all the coefficients of the expansion. You are matching the bulk energy, the surface tension, the curvature energy, and so on. And then you go to thermo thermodynamic limit and you compute the equation of the state. And what we saw is this thing, which is surprising, that the two equations of states are different, which is completely opposite to what happens with gases. If you do this thing to a gas, you will see that the equation of state is exactly the same between two models. So this is telling to you that the equation of state is more sensitive to microscopic details than in, in for a liquid than in a gas. But what we are trying to prove is that the equation of the state is identical out to a rescaling of density. So basically, if you rescale the density of each model, you will see that the equation of the states are identical. And the thing that it maybe can be proven is that the speed of sound, for example, at equilibrium, so you define the speed of sound at equilibrium for each model has to be the same if you do this perfect matching. Of course, in the end, you do this in a numerical way, so you have some errors, but theoretically speaking, they will be exactly the same. So that is the message. So liquids are universal up to a rescaling of density for the equation of state, at least. And the next thing that we are exploring is what is the universality of quantum droplets, for example. And this is particularly interesting because as you saw over here in the equation of state, the equilibrium density for each model is different. So of course, the bulk density of your droplet is going to be different. And yeah, that is what you can see here over here. So, so these are two models with two ground states which have quantum droplets. The energy is exactly the same in the two models, but the droplet pro profile is different. And what we have been able to do is to prove that the decay of density far away from the center follows this equation. So basically, it decays exponentially fast, and the exponential factor is dictated by the equilibrium energy. So this thing that appears in this exponentially basically is the first term that you obtain in your expansion of the energy. So it's the bulk energy. So if you match that term in your energy per particle, you will see that the decay of density for both droplets is the same. And this is what I'm showing to you here. And this is the two models. This dashed line is our equation. And you see that they perfectly match. So it's particularly interesting because, of course, the bulk is different between the two droplets. But what we believe is that the tail, so the decay of density, is universal. So it's particularly funny that the universality is not in the bulk, but it's on the surface of droplets. And something that we are trying to prove is that if you exactly match the energies, 
then you will see that the density profile is exactly the same as to the scaling of density. So this is the funny thing that we are finding that quantum droplets or liquids are universal up to a rescaling of density. So it seems that this equilibrium density of liquids is very sensitive to the microscopic details of your Hamiltonian. And that is something that doesn't appear to gases, for example. And yeah, with that, let me go for the conclusion. So basically, we are studying quantum liquids in optical lattices, and we believe that they offer a new perspective to study liquids in a very controlled way. So they can engineer very different Hamiltonians. So you can study with a lot of control, different kinds of quantum liquids. So I think it's particularly interesting that now we don't only have liquid helium as the only quantum liquid, but we, we can start to create a family of different quantum liquids with different Hamiltonians. And of course, from our approach, we can unravel the quantum structure of these quantum droplets. So we can really understand what are the quantum phases inside the, the droplets. And we have discovered this kind of thing, a lattice sustained quantum droplet. So quantum droplets that live in the lattice, and they live because you have this lattice structure. And yeah, we are now starting to study this universality of quantum liquids and droplets. And for the future, we are, we are starting, we are just, we just started to explore dynamics of droplets, like expansions of droplets and so on. An important question of that perspective will be to study hydrodynamics, if hydro can predict the dynamics of quantum droplets, for example. Other thing that will be interesting is to take the continuum limit of quantum log, of quantum liquids in lattices. And this is something that is particularly challenging, but maybe it's doable in the future. And of course, now it, it would be interesting because in ultra cold atoms, you have been able to create a gas, a liquid, and a solid, let's say a quantum liquid, a quantum gas, and a quantum um, yeah, liquid. So the next thing maybe that could be done is that we know that in classical physics, there are some exotic phases of matter like liquid crystals and so on. So maybe in the future, we can create like a quantum analog of that phases, like for example, a quantum liquid crystal. That would be very interesting. And yeah, that's all. So I thank you for attention. I will be happy to answer questions. Okay, questions. I I have a basic one. Mm -hmm. I, I got confused with the equation of state for the droplet. So I understand this uh, nuclear-like formula with the surface and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. for a given droplet, but then what do you mean with equation state? Is uh, you're looking at large droplets or a collections of droplets or what? No, so this is for, let's say, finite number of particles and finite volume, okay? You compute that, you compute the ground state of your Hamiltonian in that situation. And you are, let's say, doing the computation in a box. So really a box. So you are breaking translation and invariance explicitly. These computations were done assuming that the solution is homogeneous. So you are finding the homogeneous solution, right? So you are doing like periodic boundary conditions. You are fixing homogeneous solution. So you don't obtain droplets over here. And yeah, you can understand that as the as the limit of having an infinite extended droplet, if you want. Okay. So then the speed of sound is the excitations of that infinite the the excitations of that infinitely long droplet or? Yes. So the speed, I mean, you can compute the speed of sound in, ma in many different ways. You can define it thermodyna thermodynamically speaking. That will be computing derivatives of this equation of state, for example. And for a droplet, the speed of sound will be to perform the calculation in equilibrium, at, at density of equilibrium in this minima over here. So you have to compute the derivative around this minima, for example, yeah. Other questions? So, so one question about this, uh, you know, you claim there is this universal density profile of a droplet uh, that at the large separation, large distances goes as uh, exponential, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if this is, uh, uh, oh, this is one dimensional. So you're assuming there is some kind of this row of atoms, yes, right? Yes, that has yes. some limit. Yes, okay. But so then uh, this is very different from ordinary liquids where you would have some surface tension, right? So here there is no surface tension. There's just this exponential edge to the droplet. So that's a good point. This is capturing the tail of the droplet. So really yeah. what happens very far, far away from the droplet. 
So surface tension is other thing. This is surface tension is what happens in the meniscus. So in the in this middle region over here. Yeah. But with only one dimension, can you have surface tension actually? So, so yeah, that's a very funny thing that in one dimension, surface tension is a single point. So yeah. So these are two points. So basically in one dimension, this is this formula. That if you see the energy, it has um, so you you put the number of particles here multiplying, you see that energy is surface tension. It doesn't yes. go with the number of particles. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So, so it's can you which just is a constant in the, can, in the energy. Could you see what happens in two or three dimensions with quantum droplets? Yeah, yeah. This is other thing that it will be we I would like to do it in the future. But for higher dimension, we don't have numerics. So our numerics works in 1D. But yeah, we can you can extrapolate these things, the theory part in 2D and 3D. And basically, in this expansion, the, the coefficients, these powers change. Yeah. And this, for example, we are now trying to obtain this decay in 3D, for example. How does it look, the decay of density at long distances in 3D? That you have some corrections, of course. So can one do experiments with this, where you can form quantum droplets at these very low temperatures and then see how they behave? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yes, yes. This, I mean, these initial things were experiments. So if they have enough resolution yeah. of, of the spacing, the real spacing, they can see how the case of density, of course. OK. That so then they could, they could do experiments, for example, have they observed if they, if they can spin and then how the shape changes with the spin of these droplets? With the spin, what do you mean? If they, you know, they can spin the droplets, they can have angular momentum, right? Ah, okay, yeah, 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 yes. They, this is something that I think that theoretically people are starting to explore, because we, when you start to spin these objects, so these are superfluids, so you start to create vortex in the in the center of the droplet, for example. Yeah. Is there any experimental evidence of this uh, universality that you find? Uh, not that I know. But yeah, it would be very nice to see that in an experiment. And numerically, it works, of course, but it would be nice to see in an experiment. So I think that to have such resolution, people have to move to optical lattices, of course, because these experiments were done in continuum. So there is no lattice underlying this experiment. So first thing that people have to do in experiments is to move to optical lattices. And in, in that way, you, you will have this resolution over here that you can really see how the atoms are distributed in real space. And with that resolution, I think that people could be possible that they will see this universality of details. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More questions, comments? Well, um, we thank uh, Ivan for this uh, extremely interesting talk. Uh, it's a really interesting topic. And uh, thank you all for participating. And next week we have another, uh, another seminar. So I hope you to see you there. And thank you again. Thank bye, you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks very much.